Good morning and welcome uh, to another of the Nautical Institute's technical webinars. Uh, today's subject is bulk carrier operations. Uh, so welcome, I'm David Petreko with the Nautical Institute's headquarters staff in London. And I'm joined here by Costas, David and Gulam, who will uh, debate the subject with you today. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, David. Good morning, Good morning. David. Hello to everyone. So before we start, I hope everybody's familiar with the Nautical Institute, but if you are not, um, we are a international professional body. We, our prime role is to help our members um, develop themselves professionally to learn uh, continuous learning throughout their lives. We also represent our members at various forums uh, and have a seat at the IMO and a few other organizations. And our business is sharing information and uh, collecting best practice. And that's certainly what we've been doing over the last couple of years on the subject of bulk carrier operations. And we have this lovely <coughs> brand new, still sticky from the press book that we're gonna talk about today. So um, I hope you enjoy that. Um, Obviously, uh, bulk carrier safety is a huge issue for the Nautical Institute um, and also other organizations which you'll hear from, and we hope to have captured some best practice in, the, in this book. So uh, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is an interactive session, although your cameras and microphones will not work, but you can communicate with us by text and ask questions. Um, you have probably in the upper right of your screen a little control panel. You have this little white arrow in an orange field that uh, expands or contracts the control panel. When it's expanded, you have various options. Uh, there's an area where you can type a question and send it. You can press a little send button down there in the corner. Um, and there's also a handout if you'd like to download it. It's the brochure for the book. If for any reason uh, the software goes into your background, um, there's a little logo like this on the bottom uh, that will bring it back into the foreground. So, After the presentation, uh, after the webinar, you will have a little um, quiz, uh, not a quiz, a, a survey. Uh, and if you don't mind taking just a couple minutes to fill out that survey, it will help us uh, continually improve our offerings. A few hours after uh, the webinar ends, you will receive a nice little email saying, thank you for attending. And in that email, there will be a link to a certificate that's customized to you with your name. Uh, feel free to save it, print it, whatever you'd like to do with it. A recording of this will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and type in Nautical Institute, you'll find it, and it should be uh, prepared and posted by tomorrow. Now, you are not alone. There are probably, now this is a couple hours old, but there are probably over 800 of you out there. Um, so when asking questions, please be as succinct as possible, which will certainly help me field the questions which I'll be putting to the panel. Right, now we can start. I would like to introduce Captain Ghulam Hussein. Uh, Ghulam has a lifetime in bulk operations, uh, from sailing them to sailing as captain on them, to trading them, etc., etc. He is not only a scholar, but a gentleman, uh, a former colleague, and a dear friend. So, uh, Captain Hussein, over to you, please. Um, thank you very much, David, um, and a warm welcome from London to all the viewers who have attended this webinar. And I'm absolutely honored to be chairing this along with my very dear colleagues, Costas uh, from Intercargo, and of course, our very, very uh, famous uh, David Peel from Brightship. So that's that's the, that's the panel you have, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I hope the time zones are not affecting you too much. But uh, uh, before we start, this guide to bulk carrier operations is is is, is a sequel 
uh, of sorts to the first two editions of bulk carrier practice and our gratitude and acknowledgments go to Captain Jack Isbester who, who, who wrote those two things. This is the newest things, as David had said, it's, it's absolutely pure in mint condition, which has come out of the press. And it is the duty of this panel, as well as, you know, to introduce this book and to take questions and to discuss, because it's one of the most important things uh, which is going on uh, with bulk carriers. So anybody who wishes to get some quick knowledge about bulk carriers, this is the book to refer to. And a wonderful job from, of course, our Bridget Hogan uh, from the Nautical Institute and the editor Paul Gunton. Now that the acknowledgments are over, I would like to proceed with your permission on, on my slide one, which is just giving you a little bit of a background. Most of you know about it but it's, it's always good to go down memory lane and see what happened when. So I would start with the state of affairs. This would be the first of my slides. Uh, I didn't know this, but the first bulk carrier apparently uh, was built in 1852. How big are the bulk carriers? This is for the novices, uh, those who are aspiring to get a sea carrier. For those pros who are here, I know you know it all, but just for everybody's sake, you could start from a small one or two hole bulk carrier to as big as a Vail Max, which is the biggest iron ore carrier today in the market, which is like 400,000 dead weight. So that's the kind of uh, range you're looking at when you talk about bulk carriers. Uh, information, information, information from Intermanager is as of January 2019, you're looking at are on almost about 11,500 bulkers. So bulk carriers are a substantial uh, tonnage in the in the global merchant fleet. Uh, is, 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 is more than 20% at this moment in time. Now comes the uh, sad parts of bulk carriers. History, 2009 uh, up to 2018. For that span, they say they've lost, we've lost about 188 of our compatriots at sea. So as, I, as we speak, we'll go into bits and pieces of why and how and how things can be improved. And the book gives ample reviews on these uh, precautions we must take to reduce these numbers, if we may. Uh, within this period, again, I mean, 48 bulk carriers, that's a huge amount. Uh, over 10,000 dead weight were total losses. So that's to, just to give you a little bit of a brief uh, background on the state of affairs. This would be slide two of the same, which is a continuation. Uh, most of us, you know, who've been at sea for a long time would never forget the Derbyshire, which went down uh, in, in the South China Sea 1980s, Typhoon Orchid or Orchid. Um, I was very much in Japan taking over the delivery of a ship when Typhoon Orchid was, was in progressing towards Japan. And I do remember we had to rush out of the shipyard and, and get into the anchorage. And we were, you know, underway all night just to get rid of the, the, the worst of it. But that was a huge loss to the fleet here. And it was structural damage. Uh, I won't go into details of that. That's for another day. But you're looking at raised forecastle not being there, the hulls the hatch covers collapse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the whole report is there for those who are interested to know what happened. And then you can see, I've, I've jumped to 2011, where the Vail Beijing, the 400,000 ton sort of uh, vessels which I was talking about earlier, it had a ruptured hull and crack in ballast tanks as well. So that goes to show again, kind of a structural thing. And now I will rush through three or four names, which shows, if I may use the word, the major culprits of, of, of these bulk carrier disasters. One would be the bulk Jupiter 2015, 56,000 tonner. One with the Noor Alia, again, 2019, 52,000 tonner. And we have a spate of these vessels, which has gone down because of liquefaction of nickel ore, which was a culprit cargo. 
um, and now it's getting a bit tighter rules regulations for his carriage but you can just see how quickly things develop the stellar banner was an iron ore problem and of course who can forget the, the current wakashio which is 203,000 dead weight you're looking at her being broken in in, in mauritius but in nickel ore just by carriage of nickel ore disasters 81 seafarers lost lives since october 2010 so that is something which we have to take care of where does this lead us to if, if we look into the book you will see there are loads of things which are suggested as things to be done but the, the the basic thing we've got we've got rules we've got regulations we've got imo we've got solace we've got marpole every little thing you can think of but these things lead to modern technologies all these rules and regulations are leading to modern technologies but definitely it doesn't replace human experience and diligence which we think is is missing and i will touch a little bit more on on that as we go along the slide we have to learn from the past and when we talk about learning from the past it is absolutely uh, impossible to comprehend why we are still having accidents with people not following rules or being you know affected or injured when they are entering enclosed spaces this is something which is which is being hammered which is being drilled every ship management company every isps sms you can think of speaks about checklists and you know the precautions to be taken and what is to be done and what is not to be done however i think the main thing is somewhere along the line we are being complacent and we are not learning from the past that is the uh, that is the main thing which even this book everything is what is to be done how do you prepare things so we have these wonderful authors and there are about 23 contributors if i've counted it correctly all from different spectrums of, of the industry who've come back with their with their experiences and this is what is being presented in this book so we've got to learn from the past and closed spaces is something which is still prime most in, in in a bulk carrier operation where people are being affected of course it is also a huge thing in tankers etc but uh, a lot of of these accidents are happening in bulk carriers and uh, the other important fact or factor to consider would be the hatch covers the watertight integrity of the vessel so that we don't have repetitions of what happened uh, with the Derbyshire. Of course, nothing, nothing can really, really, um, you know, uh, defend ourselves from the forces of nature if it goes beyond, beyond what is expected to be normal. But again, the message to everybody is that there is no place for com complacency. Uh, in in shipping of any form and of course since we are talking about bulk carriers no place for complacency on bulk carriers uh, what does this book entail um, and it's not only the book i mean the bulk carrier operations um, i must say uh, I, I must let everybody know here that there are certain areas like even if you talk about carriage or even you know nickel or disasters or liquefaction there is no end to the amount of information which is available to the to the common you know reader uh, there's so much you could do you could do a you could do a thesis on it you, you could have a a full five year experiment and and research on it and still not have all the answers so what i'm trying to present to you is what is evidently in this book um, it is a, a quick guide that is the important word you must understand when you're looking and flicking through this book it prepares you 
for somebody, for example, who who's never sailed on a bulker and he's got about eight years experience on tankers and comes to bulkers, uh, you know, that is the time when complacency comes in. And my request is, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, there's no place for complacency because bulk carriers have their own little challenges, their own little emergencies. And uh, please never ever take things for granted. So what is in effect being mentioned in this book from the wonderful list of contributors which I've mentioned, you, you've got a preparation mode, a couple of chapters devoted to that. And then of course there is the loading. Once the loading is completed, that this is where we think, oh, now, now it's time to relax because you've got a 30 day voyage ahead of you if you're going from say Brazil to China. But carriage is important. There's so many checks. There are so many tests. Um, you know, you're looking at different types of cargo. You're looking at coal. Uh, you're looking at ore. So every little cargo has every little, you know, new challenges. Um, then you have to look after the weather. You have to prepare for for your next voyage. Uh, your, your routing plans. Uh, you know, you have to make sure you don't go aground uh, like 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 the poor little ship did in Mauritius. But uh, overall, the book surmises the preparation, the loading, the carriage, and then we go on to the arrival. And we've we've put in a new sort of a uh, we discussed a new uh, uh, chapter uh, subdivision here, which is the terminal information. Uh, things are improving. It's normally the old bulkers, which are the handy sizes, going into um, small ports, discharging with their own little cargo gear onto barges and coming back. You're looking at terminal terminal operations. And when you look at operations in a terminal, you're looking at huge vessels where stability is a huge thing, uh, where, you know, um, Loading is a, is a fantastic thing. You've got to have a, a a very practical and a very workable ship to shore communication. And overall, you've got to have a crew to crew communication. I think that is the main thing which is miss, missing, the crew to crew communication. All the way in our SMSs, ISPSs, you know, we, when we follow the rules and uh, when we have the vetting and we have our uh, DP, uh, DPOs are doing internal audits. We talk about ship shore communication, uh, but I think the essence which is missing is possibly the crew to crew communication, where a lot of other items come in, like language barriers. Um, is it only a checklist, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, there is no end to these discussions. So I would just sort of stick on to what is in the book and how that would help all of us. Uh, there's very, very good information on terminal uh, operations, on the arrival things, starting from tendering of NOR to readiness to, uh, you know, surveys, arrival surveys, departure surveys, bunker surveys. So you get a small little uh, token of checklist, which is in the book where, where you can have a look and which would be a very, very quick guide. And of course, then again, you come into the discharge uh, which is, again, another part of the entire saga of preparing, loading, carriage, terminal information, and arrival. So having said that, I would request um, David to put on the next slide for me, please. Right, I've already mentioned this, but uh, in the event you would like to know uh, how much work and how much how much cooperation has gone into into the developing and the, and, the, and the publishing of this book, you will see that this book has articles written and peer reviewed by over 20 experts. And in that panel, you have engineers, you have IMOIG or reps, you've got insurers, very important. You've got the lawyers, you've got mooring specialists, seagoing masters, ship managers, and even surveyors. So. That is the spectrum of, of, of people who have, who have participated in this, uh, in this venture. 
right. And this is the the penultimate uh, slide. Um, as 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 a fellow of the Nautical Institute, as somebody who's been with the headquarters for a long time, as somebody, you know, who who is a colleague of all of you there worldwide, um, it would be it would be wonderful if if you chose or if your companies chose, um, you know, in in bulk or in singles or whatever, to buy this um, special book. And uh, for the, all of those who are attending this webinar, uh, we, we thank you. And then there's a uh, the the publication department has very kindly offered a 40 percent discount which means from the original price of 65 this has been dropped down to 39. how to get your copies you can send your order to pubs.admin at nortens.org just mention webinar special and please do include your delivery address in your email it will make it much much easier so that would be uh, my lot but very quickly before I finish, I know we've reached a 20 minute mark and all of you would like to hear more from our panel before we hit the most exciting part, which is the Q&A's here. I would like uh, with, uh, to introduce uh, my, my, my fantastic colleagues here, two of them. Firstly, I would introduce Dr. Costas, who's the Secretary General of Intercargo. And he would be talking about safety challenges in the past decade. A, a, a short brief. Costas, all yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Gulam. Good day to all. Good morning to all our panelists and good day to all of, uh, those watching us. It is, of course, with uh, great pleasure that uh, I accept this opportunity to say a few words on behalf uh, of uh, Intercargo on the occasion of the publication of the Nautical Institute's uh, new book, A Guide to Bulk Area Operations. Looking back in our sector, up until uh, the end of the 20th century, it would be fair to say that uh, bulk areas had a negative image, which was accentuated by some high-profile casualties and uh, other losses in the 1980s and 1990s. It became clear that the design and uh, uh, construction standards for bulk carriers uh, were not uh, what they should have been. Uh, ship sizes were growing rapidly, and the class and statutory rules uh, could not keep up. On the other hand, with other shipping sectors uh, attracting the higher quality uh, crews, bulkers were often uh, mount by seafarers lacking the training and understanding of the bulk carrier's special operational requirements. Class, uh, structural improvements, solace regulation and other industry initiatives followed to reduce the number of bulk carrier incidents. Changes that promoted safety included the introduction of the ISM code in 1998, which made improvements in uh, improvements to vessel operational safety, and also the code of practice for the safe uh, loading and unloading of bulk carriers adopted by IMO in 1997, and providing guidance to ships masters and terminal operators. Nevertheless, coming to today, operational challenges uh, are still uh, around, and accidents and losses still occur, unfortunately. The sad case of uh, Wakashio and the resulting uh, environmental uh, disaster is the latest example. So there are still important challenges. What are some of them? Reporting of accidents, investigation reports by flag states. Uh, it is a known fact that lessons learned from uh, Marine accidents are key to improving safety. And uh, it is from the accident reports that the lessons uh, learned are identified. And ma another major issue as an example is that of misdeclared cargo, and in, partic in particular the moisture related cargo failure, widely known as uh, liquefaction. The current IMS, IMSBC code provides little assistance to the bulk carrier master and crew on the subject of accurate declaration of critical. Uh, dry bulk cargo properties affecting the safety of the vessel and her seafarers. 
and most recently the challenges that seafarers are facing amid the COVID pandemic, bulk carriers being uh, tram vessels uh, with no fixed uh, itinerary, uh, loading and discharging from a larger number of ports than many other ship types, uh, as, as a result face additional complications when it comes to crew changes. So uh, our sector is always uh, ready to embrace efforts and initiatives aimed at, aimed at ensuring and enhancing the safety of the seafarer, the ship, and the integrity of the cargo. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, dry bulk shipping should be proud of the fact that it has been providing efficient and environmentally friendly services, which are much needed to meet the world's transportation requirements in basic goods. Intercargo has been promoting this messaging as we are indeed uh, committed to safety and quality in ship operations. Improvements in the safety and overall performance record in the last few decades still do not allow us not to, to relax as I tried to, 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 to briefly demonstrate. Instead, more work is needed to continue in the same uh, positive direction. Uh, so, coming to the present publication, uh, it is uh, certain that it makes a meaningful contribution in the above uh, framework of uh, reflection, offering practical and valuable uh, guidance by covering the whole breadth of bulk carrier operations from preparation and loading to carriage and up to terminal uh, discharge. Thus, it, it addresses all key topics that figure at the top of uh, our sector's uh, safety and quality operations agenda, including loading procedures, uh, hatch cover maintenance and, pro and operation, safety in enclosed uh, spaces, the IMSBC code, cargo liquefaction and other cargo perils, uh, safe mooring, and the shipshore interface. In delivering uh, the information in the guide, as I also mentioned in, in the foreword, and uh, while comprehensive in, in scope, uh, the size of the guide has been uh, wisely kept uh, concise to become an easy reference and companion to the seafarer and to every professional also ashore. Uh, this nautical institute uh, publication has managed to focus on the most important and pertinent issues, presenting them in an easy-to-read uh, layout, which makes the book, the book indeed a pleasure to read. Uh, the biggest uh, credit goes, uh, of course, to the outstanding authors uh, who share a long and hands-on experience in the dry bulk sector. They are proven professionals, best qualified to offer this up-to-date uh, guidance and their invaluable insights. And I'm glad to see many from our association's member companies figuring among them. Uh, to conclude, I wholeheartedly welcome uh, the guide to bulk carry operations and I congratulate the Nautical Institute for offering our sector one more valuable publication uh, which should find its prominent place aboard every bulk carrier and in the library of uh, every professional in our sector. Uh, I have the luxury of being able to read it while uh, having my evening coffee in the comfort of my house. Unlike our seafarers that deserve a special tribute and uh, our recognition and gratitude for the services they offer. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me this uh, short introduction. Thank you, Costas. Um, that was very kind of you for updating us. Um, if I may, with your permission, David Peel, sir, Captain David Peel, General Manager of Rightship, you have the floor for a, for a brief introduction before we go to question and answers. And uh, just a request, you know, just a brief introduction of Rightship and yourself and your comments. I will Thank keep you. It a bit brief Willem, certainly <laughs> um so my involvement um really goes back to when i started the london office of right chip 13 years ago i'd come back to dry bulk from uh quite a long stint with um lng and uh, chemicals 
and it was quite a jolt when I came back to Joy Volk, I have to admit. Um, and I welcome this book because the owners that I've been talking to all this time have been crying out for this volume to be produced. They actually wanted it, and I think it was needed. My, my hobby horse for a long time has been, I challenge and cannot accept that dry bulkers cannot be at the same standard as tankers. It defeats me that the lives of seafarers on one class of ship should be less value than on a different type of ship. It makes no sense to me. Ships are ships and should be run properly. We have to defend the people working. And I'm hoping this is part of a, a mosaic that still needs to be completed to bring up the standard of dry cargo. There's some fantastic owners out there and they're looking for help. And I think we deserve to give it to them. And I would just like to say, as Costa said, I mean, a huge thank you to the technical authors that contributed to this. I mean, I'm not a technical person. I am a manager. I can manage people and I can bring things together, but I am not a technical person. So a big thank you to them and um, wish you every success. Thank you, Gulam. Thank you very much, sir. Um, that was wonderful to hear. And back to you, David, sir, for David Patrico to lead and help along uh, the, the, the panel for the Q&A session of this uh, webinar, please. Okay, uh, thanks, Gulam. Um, the first question, uh, which comes from many different people, not least in Taz, Ian, and Michael, is why do you need a tanker endorsement but not a bulk carrier endorsement uh, for operations and is there a uh, scope for that to happen uh, that's a very good question uh, ian at all you know all, all three of you uh we we are pacing the floors of imo i mean uh, at this particular moment in time, of course, every meeting is virtual. Um, you know, I, I've been a kind of a newcomer into that. It's just been three years, four years now into the IMO. But a lot of discussions have been going on, and, and I'll be, you know, I'll be quite honest that rather than having uh, considerations of having an endorsement on the STCW certificate, like you have the tanker endorsements these days, uh, more is being considered on on how to deal, uh, you know, especially with the IMSBC code, where every year you're having three or four more editions of different types of cargo, because cargos are also being defined into many, many different cause, and I'm sure Costas would know that much better than I do. But to, to put it um, in perspective, it is being considered, it's a way, it's a bit far away for the moment, because if you have that, then you'll have to have an endorsement for maybe containers you might have and then the entire stcw gambit of the certification you know certificated for are you or do, do you have a master mariner unlimited sort of a thing that would come into question so yes. for the time being yes it is i think personally it, it it would be good for this to be taken more forward but for the moment imo which is the regulatory body which is making all these things they have not yet started on this project, if I may say so. Thank you. I would just say, Graham, I mean, this has been kicking around for a while now, this, this topic. Uh, and one of the arguments against it was that it just devalued the qualifications that the seafarers now have. So then you would finish up where you had to be separately qualified for every single aspect of the industry. Sure. I'm not sure that we're not going that way <laughs> um, as, as ships become more specialized, but that was the argument against it, and it will take a while to get there, I think. Right. Thank you. Yes. David, your uh, next question for the panel. Uh, may I have, uh, just add a quick comment, just uh, taking the opportunity from this uh, question. Uh, it is true that uh, 
comparing the bulk dry bulk sector to the tanker sector, there are some uh, significant differences. In the cargo's uh, uh, pillar um, in, in our mission is to raise the bar when it comes to safety and quality standards, when it comes to the construction, design, operation of uh, bulk carriers. Uh, we need to recognize that uh, tankers are designed, built, different standards, so, and also operated within a much stricter and uh, much more regulated, regulated and tight uh, operational framework, which encompasses the, the whole uh, chain from uh, loading terminal, from uh, shippers, the charterers, I mean, the, the ship operation is only part of the long chain of operations that is much uh, more demanding, tighter uh, in uh, the tanker sector. And uh, while from our side as ship owners, we're trying to raise uh, this, uh, the bar and the, the quality standards of operating bulk carriers is not entirely in our hands. And all stakeholders in this uh, transportation chain must uh, change uh, approach and uh, rationale and uh, make sure that they raise the standards for the benefit of our seafarers, the safe transportation and integrity of cargoes, and of course the, the, the safe uh, operation and uh, construction of uh, bulk carriers to the highest possible standards. Thank you. Just a quick comment from me. Okay, thank you, Kostas. Um, Gulam, uh, there are also uh, a number of questions around um, the comparison with the bulk fleet and the tanker fleet with things like sire inspections. Um, is there any plans to bring in uh, something like a sire inspection, but for bulk carriers? Um, David, thank you for the question. Um, I think for for this question, I, I'm I'm not much into the vetting side of stuffs. Uh, if I may, I'm not trying to put um, David Peel you you in a spot or something, sir. But uh, being right ship, I mean, and being engaged with so many superintendents, would you be able to sir, uh, deal with this question, please? You, you'll 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 be able to do it much better than I would. So over yeah. to you. Um... You have to look back to the history of how the organizations actually came into being. So on the uh, petroleum side, the SIRE inspection came into being first. Um, mm -hmm. And then came the the betting and the uh, TMSA. On the dry mm -hmm. side, we started off with the betting and then the inspection. And now we need the management standard. So we've done it the other way around. As to whether you want to go to um, inspections from you know the life of a ship, which you do with tankers, so they're inspected from from day one, and annually thereafter, if not more frequently. Whereas bulk carriers, we don't we don't have that, um, and we know as as our organisation is incredible resistance when we try and lower the age of inspection. But that's not to say it won't come. There's there's also a large argument out there that we should be doing exactly the same. Um, but with, with with COVID going on at the moment, that argument is somewhat in abeyance at the moment. But that's roughly your answer. I mean, yes. Yeah. Thank you, David Peel. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, number of questions pertaining to the um, ship shore interface. And um, I'll read one from uh, Buddha, who says, uh, please discuss the importance of the terminal ship to shore safety and operations checklist, which should have the same importance as the passage plan. And the discussion yeah, between thanks. master and pilot. So what is that importance of the ship shore meeting and communication? Yeah, Buddha, thank you. Yeah, Buddha, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I, I'll just pass it on to my, uh, you know, my colleagues in the in the panel as well. 
anything which, which I've said, ship shore communication, crew crew communication is very, very important. Now, when a pilot boards, uh, you know, whether you consider that to be a ship and a shore uh, communication is up to you, whichever terminology you use. But the more you discuss between yourselves, and the key word here is in advance, you know, well in advance if possible. You know, you can have a ship shore uh, communication with the terminal by communication, communicating with them seven days in advance or, or, you know, even 10 days in advance. And then there are some which you have to do it on the spot as you arrive. You know, there are many sort of variations. So it is an absolute, absolute priority to give this this uh, ship shore communication the highest respect and highest regard in order to have a smooth smooth loading or discharging operation and most importantly to to have a safe operation and uh, any of my panelists sir would you want to add into this costas or david peel sir i agree entirely i agree entirely and unfortunately there's not enough of it going on yeah. quite often I mean, there are there are other ports that are very good at it and take it in very seriously, but some of them, it, there's ne next to nothing, and it's just an accident waiting to happen, and that's why I was so glad to see the chapters that we had in the book, and I think mm -hmm. that's one part of the book that could do with expanding, to be quite honest, but um, let's get the book out and then wait for people to give us their comments and where we can expand it further, but I think that's one part that, yeah, I would say does need expanding further. Yes, uh, if I may add, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see there is, a, there is a chapter dedicated to the ship terminal communication and the interface. Uh, currently in the industry, uh, improvements and optimization is considered in that aspect, not only to improve safety, but also in the context of um, reducing emissions, for example with the just-in-time uh, concept and the optimization of uh, sailing and waiting time to a port. Uh, and this is a challenge there, how to optimize uh, communication between and optimized arrival time with the terminal, uh, between the ship and the terminal, so as to uh, adapt the sailing speeds and in the end reduce uh, emissions as an additional operational measure in the greenhouse gas uh, reduction measures that uh, the industry and our sector within it are trying to implement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there are quite a few questions dealing with cargoes, um, but we'll start with this one. This is from Raul, who says, um, are there any new ships designs being developed to prevent loss of stability due to liquefaction? And uh, I suppose there's that debate around liquefaction and what's being done. Uh, Raul, thank you for the question. Uh, very, very pertinent. At this moment in time, I don't think, that, you know, to the best of my knowledge is, is what uh, the, the caveat which i would take to the best of my knowledge no they are not looking at some specific ships which will be carrying uh the, the biggest culprit which i may use uh the word the culprit the nickel ore trade uh it's just a question i mean in, in our days when we used to be involved in some way of loading out uh, nickel ore from x to y I think the biggest problem there was not the ship. The ship is perfectly fine to carry any kind of cargo. It was a type of cargo where proper precaution was not being taken at the point of loading. I mean, you had an SGS or a DNV or any fantastic uh, classification society, surveying society report, plus a local inspector's report saying, this is fine, this is within the TML limits. and that certificate would sometimes be 30 days old or even 24 hours old and in 24 hours when the skies open in southeast asia loading ports you have floods you have deluges you don't have small little bit of shower so that the moisture limit goes high and where does the captain go where does the charter party lead accepting arbitration and all kinds all kinds of problems so they say right 
load, commercial reasons, load on. Then three days, four days after you've sailed out, all this excess water comes out. So I, I, I'm sorry I had to digress to what actually happens at the point of loading. But making a special ship where magically this water, which should not be there in the hold in the first place, the surveying certificates should be absolutely up to date, giving the proper content. If that is exceeded, sorry, you don't load the cargo, period. You're safe. But if you're still loading that, I don't think that any, 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 there could be a magic wand which would say the excess water which is rising after three days of rolling in the South China Sea would suddenly go into bilges and disappear. It's not gone into that, but what has gone into the dealing with these cases is stricter rules, stricter regulations at the point of loading, at the point of carriage, more observations, more soundings, more using of bilges, ensuring that any water which does increase is pumped out. I've heard, I've not seen, I've heard of ships which is using fire hoses, which has been put into the hold, and they are trying to pump out the water as well. So lots of variations, my dear friend, but we'll see where this leads to. Thank you. Yes, if you allow me to uh, add and totally agree with uh, Gulam, uh, liquefaction is uh, at the top of uh, our agenda when it comes to the safe operation of ships. Uh, we have hosted uh, regularly, we, we host uh, debates and presentations on this topic and we have hosted at least two class uh, societies presenting uh, ship designs to alleviate uh, liquefaction. Uh, these are of course uh, interesting uh, proposals that, that need to be weighted against uh, the trades that uh, such a ship can uh, serve, the flexibility in trading. Anyway, there are some considerations and technical aspects, but uh, I totally agree with Gulam that the ship is not uh, the weak uh, link in, in the chain of responsibility that uh, leads to liquefaction caused uh, losses and disasters. A, a major issue is uh, that of mystical cargo, and uh, in particular, the moisture related. Uh, uh, cargo failure mechanism, commonly known as liquefaction. Over the last 10 years, liquefaction has been responsible for the loss of over 100 seafarers' lives. Uh, last year, we had uh, the Neuralia lost with 25 crew on board. Also, the cause is not known. Liquefaction cannot be ruled out as the vessel was loaded with nickel ore. Over often, the, often the, the liquefaction case, um, with liquefaction cases, the cargo, or at least the characteristics of the cargo has been uh, misdeclared, thus preventing the ship owner from making the correct decisions with regards to the carriage of the cargo. Uh, this is also true uh, of further cargos that have been willfully or accidentally misdeclared. Declared. It is a requirement under the IMSBC code that cargos are correctly declared, but unfortunately these requirements have not been fully implemented uh, by national governments and uh, the, the local authorities' uh, implementation is, is not uh, strict and uh, thorough, which obviously doesn't help. Thank you. I'll, I'll defer to the to the experts. Um, I mean, I've I've seen some wonderful uh, presentations uh, into cargos and, and other peoples, and they, they're they're still struggling to to come up with the solution or the explanation. In fact, um, but the other thing we can't deny is that the, there's still too many instances of intimidation in the in the loading ports where the inspectors are intimidated. And that's still going on for sure, and that has to stop. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay, Captain Hussein, uh, this question is um, might be a little bit technical. It's about tank top strengths, uh, submitted by David. The question for the panel is: uh, tank top strength has been a subject of much discussion, especially for bulk carriers loading steel and the right and wrong ways to properly dunnage on the tank tops. Has this been covered in the book? Thank you. Ah, David, what an interesting question. 
Yeah, in yesteryears, I mean, you said it correctly, putting dunnage on top of the hatch cover before you put steel cargo on top of the hatch cover. Now, the question to ask is, and I'm not trying to be um, difficult here uh, in answering the question. Um, my basic presumption based on stability is that if you've got a bulk carrier loading steel cargo, uh, unless you are loading very light cargo in the holes uh, and then the steel comes in as a last resort you know you suddenly get a booking of 5000 3000 tons of steel where you don't have the space and then you're going to load it on the top of the hatch covers or you may be talking about smaller vessels which has got all through otherwise you know uh, it's a bit hard to fathom why the ship's holes are full up and then you start loading steel on top of the hatch cover. Uh, if I, if I, Willem, I, think, I think the, sorry i think the question is about loading it on tank tops not on hatch covers okay my apologies tank tops is 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 absolutely uh something which is of very very grave importance especially some old bulkers where she's done her surveys and her special surveys and they've done all the gauging and it's a bit light you got to take extra care. So the normal rules of, uh, apply, which is longitudinals, and then you have the transverse at the dunnages just to spread it properly. And if you have very, very weight specific cargo like manganese ore, for example, that you do spot sort of loadings and you're full up anyway with your dead weight. But is anything being done to address this problem or whether it is in part of the book? I don't think in rea in all honesty that we have dedicated a section, but we have dedicated a section on ore cargo. So we've got a general uh, sort of a discussion on the book, but not a specific one which deals with the cargo weights on the tank top per se. So that's my answer to the question. We have dealt with ore, we have dealt with tank tops, but not on the specific uh, how should I put it? Distribution of weight and all, which is a bit too technical to be included as a guide to the bulk carrier book. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question is from Michael, and he says, "What do you think are the three most challenging dry bulk cargoes, and why?" Michael. What a wonderful question. You've asked three, so I'll spread it between myself <laughs> and my and my learned colleagues here. Um, I, I'm going to take the easy way out. Challenging cargo for me is is definitely, I'm sure I don't want to go to coal. It's a huge thing. But I would stick with my with my culprit, which is liquefaction, which I would think is the carriage of nickel ore. Um, and David Peel, sir, you, and then Costas after you. I don't know. My experience is somewhat older. I mean, copper was always the one which I used to suffer with. Okay, copper. Okay, Corsessa, you. Uh, your your microphone may be muted, Corsessa. Sorry. I agree, Gulam. Uh, nickel or or fines. Uh, these are cargoes that um, are very high in in our. Uh, when we monitor cargo safety because they are susceptible to, to liquefaction and the barriers of uh, liquefaction but uh, any cargo should be treated according to the IMSBC code and uh, with care uh, because uh, any cargo can potentially depending on the categorized uh, category A, B or C but a, a safe uh, a theoretically safe cargo under bad uh, loading or carriage conditions or if not pro uh, properly monitored as uh, the, the authors very rightly uh, highlight also in the chapters of this book can be a source of uh, uh, danger and uh, all cargo should, should be treated with due respect if you allow me although there are some uh, cargos that are more prone to, to sure example, the, the liquefaction uh, threat yeah. Right. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I, I may just add very quickly here, because everybody talks of two little things when a disaster happens. Um, act of God, 
So anything is act of God. And then they say perils of the sea. So that's a peril of the sea. But what we forget in this entire uh, spectrum of what we are discussing is the avoidable, avoidable perils, which we can, as, as, as prudent sailors exercising due diligence, that is what we have to look out for. Um, I'm sorry for digressing, but just wanted to add that. Over to you, uh, David. Okay, uh, thank you, Golom. Um, this question comes in from Ankit, and he says, uh, he's asking about global standards for hold cleanliness, and he observes that some of the standards in the US and Australia are very high, much higher than in other places in the world, and are there international standards for hold cleanliness? If I may, I, I don't think there is an international standard of say, um, unless uh, I'm corrected by David Peel, who, who has so many other surveyors going around. Uh, but I don't think there's a scale where they say, okay, this this hatch has been cleaned grade 10, and this is grade five or four. I think a lot depends on the type of cargo you would be loading. Um, grain cargo, everybody expects, you know, speak and span. Uh, you could have bulk sugar. I mean, that's something which needs more cleanliness. But if you're looking at, you know, grain or something, it's not that you don't expect 100% clean old, but there could be some deviations. However, I I, I would ask uh, David Pilsa to to add into this, if you may, if you would kindly. I can't really help. I'm afraid we don't do cargo surveys. We do ship inspections. We're not cargo cargo surveys. So yeah, I'm not aware. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you for that. Um, I do know that. Costas. No. Uh, if you wanted my comment, I, I don't have the, the answer to this specific question. But uh, indeed, the patchwork of uh, regional regulations and expectations and standards has been uh, a source of concern when it when it comes to bulk carry operations. For example, biofouling standards has been a similar example where regional standards are much different uh, around the world, and uh, we have been supporting efforts to bring to IMO some common reference framework and benchmarking. So it's like a very valid question, but while I don't have the answer to the specific one, where, which was cargo related, if I'm not mistaken, I gave you an example of. Thanks, Costas. Um, with my eye on the time here, I think we have enough time for one more question, and it's the importance of stability in port. How can this, how the stability can continue can be continuously maintained throughout the loading and discharge um, at every stage of the operation? Uh, good question, sir. Thank you. Uh, I would really, there, there, there's, there's no complacency in any different type of vessel, but I think uh, the, the the precaution which you one needs to take is for every vessel, it is much higher for car carriers and container vessels when they're discharging or loading in port, because their uh, metacentric high GM is something which is needs to be very closely monitored with adequate and absolutely timely ballasting or deballasting. When it comes to bulk carriers, rather than stability, I'm not trying to digress out of the question, uh, rather than stability itself, you're looking more at structural uh, precautions. You could have a Panamax loading, and if the alternate hole loading is not being monitored properly by the chief officer, you can hog, you can sag, you can do a lot of damage which will be not seen immediately, but continuously avoiding those things would damage the construction of your vessel. And it would play with this with the stability. Overall, the word stability may not just necessarily mean the metacentric height. It could be the stability of the vessel, loading, healing, list. So all these things will have to be taken into account. But from my perspective, a bulk carrier alone, I think stability as in pure stability which is the metacentric height which possibly uh, is being questioned i don't think they really 
have as much a danger. I wouldn't say uh, they have; not, they do. They can just go to sleep and not worry about it. But that is what I would say, if I may. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Gillam. I, I do note that the, our time is just about up. Uh, that, that previous question, by the way, was from Hussein. So thank you, Hussein, for that. Um, I think this must be one of your relatives, Gulam, because uh, Ahmed says it Captain. Be, it, would be. it says Captain Hussein is just brilliant and confident. This is what we need more of oh. in the industry. Bravo, sir. So I don't know. You can pay him now. Yeah, I suppose that's fair. He's my third cousin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay. So just in, in order to wrap this up. Uh, certainly, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming and uh, supporting the Nautical Institute, not just with this webinar, but with the production of, of the book and our, our attempt to work together to make uh, bulk carrier operations safer and more effective. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, just to remind everybody that the book um, is available for discount uh, if you write to pubs admin. And, but don't answer now. This is my tele sales. You also get, <laughs> if I can press the right button. Some of you may have uh, seen um, our webinar last week on hatch cover inspections. And that book um, is also on discount with this webinar. So feel free to do that. And also um, the um, webinar on hatch cover inspections was absolutely brilliant. If any of you missed it, if any of you have any desire to sail on a bulk carrier, watch that. It's about an hour and a half long, but it is the most brilliant discussion and explanation and technical drawings, and it's just fantastic. So go back to a uh, YouTube channel and, and watch that. Um, final point is we are a membership organization. Uh, we are about sharing ideas and developing best practice. So please join us, join the discussion, join the debate, help us share information and help us all be better professionals. So on that note, uh, gentlemen, I, I will thank you again and invite you to log off uh, and I will close the system for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.